Okay, uh, thanks very much everyone for uh, joining us today for this masterclass on information governance, making it work. Uh, it will be delivered by Professor Ali Brown, my colleague from University of Aberdeen. Um, she's joining us remotely from Japan today. So I'll be um, uh, now it's all to you. Fantastic, thank you. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, thank you everyone for, for coming to session today. I'm very much looking forward to it. Thank you particularly to Virju and for, to John and to all the IT team in Cambridge who are hopefully making this work. Fingers crossed it, it is going to work. We are exploring information and technology, so hopefully it will work. Um, so to start off, um, I actually prepared this, I happen to now be in Japan, but I prepared most of this presentation when I was on research leave in Melbourne. So I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I prepared this work, the unceded land, and pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging. So this is the second time I've given a masterclass um, to the, the NERC CDE gathering, of which now we're called the, the Digital Gathering. Um, and last time we did a really fantastic session and we had some really great discussion. I felt that that session was a bit more about me sharing information from my side of things and I'm hoping that this will um, move things on a little and I, it will be more focusing on what perhaps a more the science informed view and I hope very much to learn from you. I certainly did a lot last time. So hoping we'll have a very interactive session. We're going to be exploring how information governance can really work. I did quite a lot of research, uh, with some, maybe with some of the people who are in the room, some of the uh, other CDE senior experts, some of the people who are working in this space. And some of the common themes were, you know, it's all really, really complicated. And I just want to do my job. I don't want to have to become a legal expert how can we actually make it work? So I'm hoping that this both as a session today and can set down some future foundations as to how we might, as a community, try to make it work. So I'm going to try and explore and learn from you some of the relevant laws and regulations to working in this space and information governance, some funder industry and scientific norms, which are of course changing, which is very exciting, but practically can also be a bit of a challenge if this is not generally your daily priority. Really like to learn from you, your challenges and successes. Again, I've, I've heard some experiences and I'd really like to hear more. I'd really like to hear from you what would help you and also to share some of the research I've been doing on what to help is out there, whether we find that this helpful or not. Um, having a, be a little bit more of a science focus rather than a more legal perspective, although we had a really valuable discussion generally last time. So to perhaps preempt that, you may already have had a look, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you if you have, but on the website for this session, we've got a link to the slides which were updated, taking into account some of the points that we discussed last time to the CDE 2022 masterclass. So there's a lot there, more sort of legal background side of things. So if you haven't had a look at that and you do have an, an interest in that, please have a look at that. And obviously, if you would like to speak to me about anything, please do get in touch. Um, I'm hoping as well as the science focus, we'll have a real cross-cutting theme. Um, I'm really sorry, I so enjoyed being in Birmingham last time. So I'm hoping, hoping this can time with the rest of the discussions in Cambridge, um, looking your themes, of course, you're familiar, next generation sensing, data science, tools and techniques, environmental data, and building confidence and trust, people and skills. So that's a very broad overview. I'm gonna talk for maybe about 20 minutes, um, setting out some things that I see as particularly relevant. I've drawn together some checklist type things as well that from some of the, the, the research and discussions I've been having that people might find helpful. Obviously, if anyone has any comments at any time, if you are in the room, please put up a physical hand and Bridget will tell me to shut up. Um, if you are if you are online, um, let me have a look at the, the chat. I've got the chat function open. So if you are online and, and you would like to put something in the chat, please do. I've also got the Slido open in front of me. Um, and that's um, that's um, CD, sorry, no, DD 20, 23. Um, and then looking for this masterclass. So if you have any questions in there, please do put them in. Um, and there's seamlessly been going on. I was about to ask for to move and you have clicked on. So thank you so, 
So very, very much for that. So I'm going to be leading this. You hopefully will be leading and challenging me in this. We have Bridget, John and IT support in the room. Questions in the main via Slido. And we are recording. Um, I hope this isn't going to stop anyone participating. Um, I sort of find last time, um, I will tuck my notes from last time into some other work I'd done in the network. But I think this would be really great to have this as a resource which we can share with others in our community. So hopefully people are comfortable with that and we can have a very open and collaborative and sharing discussion as we go forward. And Berju, if you could click to the next the next slide, please. Um, great. So key themes as we're going through a really strong focus on um, the growing importance of open research, open data, open access. But what, of course, do they actually mean in different people's day jobs, which I suspect there's probably quite a lot of variety in the room. And also that can really vary whether we're looking at metadata, whether we're looking at data sets, and whether we're looking at outputs and publications. We'll have a look at funders, NERC, obviously a key priority, but some others as well. We'll look at the stances taken by governments, particular focus on the UK government, but so many of us are working internationally, so I think it's important to have that, that wider viewpoint. But look at some stances which are being taken at that national level, such the Geospatial Commission and its work in relation to the Geo6, which I, I know many of you have shared with me that this is, very, this is highly relevant to some of you, but it is only limited. There's some really valuable work which is not being covered by the Geospatial Commission. We'll look at some information sharing regimes from the regulatory and legal side of things. We will look, I suppose, at things that I tend to think of broadly as more things that are in, in, what a scientist would instinctively think of. And you're very welcome to challenge me on that, uh, I, although I'm not in the room, but spent a lot of time with scientists recently, particularly in the ocean governance space. Lots of discussions about the importance of FAIR, FAIR data, the DORA new evaluation process in relation to open science, the fourth Lauderdale approach, that careful balance of results being immediately available because this is so important for a collaborative open scientific process as against also the wide recognition ac across the international science community about the need to be to or perhaps we may discuss this but a, a view that there's a need for one success to be recognized and to be respected and to be able to get that initial publication in and the final theme running through this will be the different business models if one is in business again some of the room may think you're not there to be businesses but we, we are there to be academic scientists but if we are looking at business models what should be driving this is it sharing is it reward what type of reward is that? Is, is that a salary? Is that a grant? Is that a, a great publication? And the different mixes which might come within that. And who says which is going to apply in which situation? And how widely is that shared? Particularly, again, if this is not perhaps one person's day job and this is only something which pops up from time to time. So, Berju, if you could press on, please. Fantastic. So going to spend some time just exploring a little bit of that wider context of that scene setting that, that, that I was talking about. So what do we mean by open? And this is one thing that I've had many interesting discussions over the years with lawyers, with scientists and, and, and lots of different types of scientists. What do we really mean by open? As a starting point, I'm a, an information and technology lawyer. and I, when I first left professional legal practice to work at the academy, we set up a genuinely online, open access, peer-reviewed, freely available journal. And it's highly respected in its field. This is a very exciting thing to do, but it also meant for a long time, when I heard the term open access, I thought that was what that meant. And I've very much been learning over the years that this, of course, is not necessarily what it always means. And I think a very interesting example, some of you which I suspect are a lot more familiar with this than I am, but the open, for example, could be quite legitimately used as a term to apply to the approaches taken by the Ordnance Survey in relation to their data and their maps. But actually within that, we have the master map, which is free, genuinely free immediately. But for the rest of that, you have to pay. You have to pay a premium service. And without for now getting the discussion about whether this is fair enough or not, it's open, but it's not necessarily free or it's not necessarily 
free immediately. So an interesting question when one is thinking about open, what is it actually meaning here? And we can see the balances around which this might mean, um, explored also in the UK's geospatial strategy. So mission one is talking about safeguarding data. The UK needs to create the right market conditions and incentives for innovation. Now we'll come back and talk about that later, because again, this, this is where we are, but this, this, this might seem controversial or interesting to some. But it's talking about we must incentivize innovation, we must make use of information, but we must also safeguard national security, intellectual property rights, which we looked at a lot last time, and individual privacy. So we're talking a lot about sharing, a lot of making this more widely available. But there's an awful lot of caveats in there. Now, they're fantastic to a lawyer. They're really annoying, I suspect, to people which isn't really their day job. We can also see I refer before to FAIR. Open can, in fact, refer to different qualities of data. Is it FAIR, findable, accessible, interoperable and usable? Does it mean free at the point of use, genuinely free? Or does it mean simply that it's got clear licensing conditions? So there might be quite a lot of restrictions on what you can do with, with it. And you might have to pay quite a lot, but you can get it. And it's coming perhaps in an interoperable format. So that might suffice to be seen as open data. Now, whether you're doing a funding application, which I was doing before I came on this call, or whether you are trying to plan a dissemination process, work on a data management plan, the different meanings of openness, I think, are, are extremely, extremely important. And what we also see in the geospatial strategy, which I, th I think summarizes this quite nicely, says to unlock the power of location, we need to take a balanced approach that considers the costs, the value and sensitivity of individual types of data. Now, again, lawyers love this type of thing. Um, Bertie, you can tell me later what the body language is in the room of whether this is just something which is really annoying for scientists. I put in some um, some bits and brackets after that, that wording on the slide. Um, value. Value, I think, um, in the year or so since I've been working in this space, this kind of seems to become a much, much, much more topical term. Um, and I re really welcome thoughts that people might, might want to share on that. It's seeing the golden thread throughout. It's all about value, but also what are we meaning in value? Are we meaning financial value? Are we meaning recognition? Are we meaning short term, longer term value? So I think that's, again, something of which a lot of things can, can need to be unpacked. We're talking about the sensitivity of data. Now, is this someone's individual personal information? Is the fact that someone types trade secret? Is it the fact that you're a scientist and you and your team have had this massive breakthrough and you simply think that you should be able to control information tied in with location? So all of these are within a strategy which is really trying to set out, we're going to safeguard data and we're going to incentivize it as effectively as we can. There's lots and lots hidden within there. And again, if this, if this isn't normally what you do, we've got a case study we're coming on shortly to explore together, this might be quite confusing, or it might be extremely straightforward. Really interested in to hear it, hearing from everyone. There's the concept of, of the race. It's the concept of are you all, perhaps within teams as individuals or between teams, are you under pressure? Are you competing with each other? you're under pressure to publish, you're under pressure to get more grants. So you really want to get that information out there as quick as you can. You want to get it out there for your shareholders, depending on the size of your business, you want to get it out more, more widely into the market to raise further funds. So you want to publish it. Now, there are some exceptions in information control regimes, Freedom of Information Act, um, both environmental ones and the wider ones. We had a really interesting discussion about that last year. There are some exceptions to needing to share that information. So people can come to you, they can say, I want to know that and receive that information as part of freedom of information. You can say, no, no, I, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I can take advantage of that exception. Tying in, recognising perhaps that, that, that race that's, that scientists might perceive themselves as being part of. And also perhaps linked in with that is the fact that open is great. Open, open as in free beer, open as we can get it immediately, open as unrestricted, open from um, a, a pure, pure perhaps academic view of science. 
That's fantastic. But someone is having to pay. And we had a really great discussion at the University of Aberdeen as part of an open research workshop a few months ago now, saying that one might, one might think it's great you don't have to pay, but someone is having to pay, whether that's coming off a block grant, whether that's coming off the, the budget that your spin out is trying to put together. Someone is having to pay. And are we almost losing that within the concept of too much openness and ultimately how is this actually working yet again we're working in the context of ref 28 um you may or may not be, be immersed in that i've certainly been having a look at that so ref 28 for uk universities we're looking at a really strong focus on an environment, on culture and on collaboration. There's still some consultation to go, but that seems to be where we're going. So I think it will be interesting to see where, where the future of openness and information governance and sharing as opposed to control ties in within all of that. And a final point on this slide, and this is the lawyer's cheats, sheets, truth all coming out now. Um, the importance to check all the time you're working in the space, you are either looking to, you know you're working with information governance and you're trying to find an answer, or you haven't a clue what is going on and this is this really strange world. Check, 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 which is really painful because you might not think it's your priority or your day job. Looking at the bottom of pages is a really, really good idea. Um, but looking at funder policies, looking at the license, look at standard operating procedures. Um, if you're not a university research manager or data research manager, then there is some fantastic resource which is available. If you are in a university, if you're in a small spin out, this is obviously is a lot more difficult because it might be coming back into you. There's evolving standards all the time. There's there's lots of different as well national forms of infrastructure support, which is there. We'll be touching on that a little bit more detail. But I wanted to set that through and I'll continue in a similar vein on the next slide, because there's a whole jigsaw, I think, of information which is there, but also a whole jigsaw of slightly competing strategies which are there. And it's very much relevant to what we're we're exploring, controversy, which we're exploring. Um, do the NERC work, but it can also seem slightly unclear about is anyone actually in charge? And it's certainly not me. So really interested to, to, to discuss this. OK, so as you mentioned, there's particular national differences. Now, some of this is, is intra UK, Scotland, England, differences, differences notably, which we, we, we'll, we'll touch on shortly in a second. But also if you're on a global project, Brexit has a huge implications for things. So something really important to be aware Maybe also if you've been working working in rivers and you're going to going to move into to, to, to something else, perhaps more coastal work, um, the regimes might be operating slightly differently there. It's important to be aware of that. When I spoke to you all last time, um, I, I started a little bit of a fight when I said I didn't believe in the concept of owning data. I still don't quite believe in the concept of owning data, but it's been really fascinating in, in, in this data journey in, in the environmental community to see the, the ever present concept of owning data. So where a lawyer, where a philosopher may not think that one can own data, it is absolutely, I see very much within the space that, that you are all working. So maybe no one really owns the data, but some people certainly think they own the data and they have power and responsibility in respect of the data. And this has given them the power to create different forms of funding regimes. Now, sometimes that's a government, sometimes it's a funder, sometimes it's an individual scientist, sometimes it's a company. Sometimes it goes right back to some, some historical points. I'm not sure if, if Steve or Ron are in the room, but we've had some great discussions over the years about taking soil as an example. So James Hutton Institute in Aberdeen, we have the open data license, the approach which is taken to soil in Scotland is very different from the approach which is taken in relation to England because of the situation back in, back in the 80s, I think it was now when we have um, Cranfield ending up very broadly with the soil databases and Cranfield is there depending on the status of the user in a situation to looking at to commercialise the release of that data. Now, the same thing can happen in relation to Scotland, but on a different form of framework, a different type of licence. And that's just the type of thing that it can be really quite painful if this isn't your priority to realise that 
one might have to navigate. When then one is looking at licenses, if you dug them out from um, the small print hidden away in, in, in a website, um, key things which I think are quite interesting to look for, and again, really interested in le learning experiences that you might have been encountering. Um, what do you say you can do right now? What can you do with your results? What do they actually say about the use that you can make of data now and also what how widely you might be able to share the data in the future can you pass that on can it be part of further improvement or next generation work what does it does it say about publication does it make any difference if your work is commercial or non-commercial and i think this can this can be really fascinating because particularly if you're say in a in a spin out company or indeed you're in a business, but you are doing a lot of research, you'd say this is not really focused on getting a product to market. That non-commercial commercial decision, which is very deeply embedded, often simply doesn't really work anymore. So something to look out for, but also to, to then question, again, I look forward to discussing whether this is actually something which works effectively just now. There's a focus on what, what I and others I, I've noticed talking about almost raw data as opposed to value added data. Huge debates whether there is any data which is raw, whether everything is always the result of some form of expertise to, to, to bring that out, to, to analyse soil, to value soil. Again, Ron, if you're in the room, we've had some great discussions on that over the years about how you can try to get the different types of knowledge which are relevant to something which might seem to, to be raw. And then if we're adding value to something, you know, who says, what are the different types of value which might be added and what are the different requirements which are a license when, if you're trying to get that data in to be part of your research, what might you be able to do with that? And a really important point, and again, we've had discussions of, about this in the past, um, and I know certainly the open government license, which we'll, we'll touch on shortly and some other licenses, often do say, you are taking this data as it is, we're not giving you any sort of warranty as to its accuracy or completeness, and whatever you go away and do with my data in the future, we take no responsibility for that. Now, from a lawyer's point of view, that's that's great because that's quite clear. Um, that's, of course, law lawyers. Um, we don't think we're, we're, we're that perfect. Um, you can put one thing in a license. I very much you know, we've had some really great discussions over the years about, well, if, if, if someone is taking your data and they're being part of a project that you don't feel comfortable with that, is that in some way going to rebound on you? And what might you be able to do about that? One thing that I've been learning a lot from discussions with, with colleagues recently and, and through some of my own research is if you're looking at a license and if you're or indeed if, you, if you're drafting a license in a situation where you do have any more autonomy, what, what do licenses actually say about what you're trying to do with information and how you may share it and when you may share it, both in relation to the publication, but also in relation to the actual data set and what requirements are being set out now that may be the funder it may be by your university about getting a new DOI minting a new DOI for a data set really making that clear and several people have said to me you know we read publications but there's a DOI but we don't know if that DOI is for the publication we don't know if it's for the data set I think we're very much in a situation when it should be that it's very clear from the, the licenses about when you get the data in, what you can do with it, and you should make that clear in your publication, both for the output and for the data set. But my sense also, and again, you're on the ground and really welcome your thoughts, that we're maybe in a bit of an interim transition stage about actually really learning to, to make that work. So the rules, I think, are pretty clear, but that doesn't mean that everyone is actually following them or people might not need, need guidance to do that. Um, an interesting question, again, welcome your thoughts. Are people doing, do as you would be done by? Do you think others are doing as you would be done by? Are you, what, what, what barriers are there? Because of course, everyone is trying to do their very best. What barriers are, are there perhaps out there to people being able to do that if your perception is that people aren't in fact always doing that? What, what more support is needed? Is that within universities? Is that within funders? Is there a space for for, for the, for the NERC, NERC and this environment group to help as well in relation to data management and dissemination plans, for example. 
Bruce, if I can ask you to. Uh, I mean, we have a couple of questions from. Sorry, Slavia. please. Would Excellent. you like to take them now or later on? Yes. Why don't we take? Why do we take them now? Thank you. Is that is that is that on Slido? Oh, yeah. Oh. Slido. Yeah. Oh, ex excellent. Thank you. Oh, so wonderful. Um, so we have one from Matt. Hello, Matt. Um, could I describe the Fort Lauderdale thing? Now, maybe the best thing if I can do is this going to be too much multitasking? Um, so the, the Fort Fort Lauderdale was um, a sort of declaration about. Um, about share, share, sharing outputs. Um, let me just call this up. Um, and so if we have Dora, which is about evaluating um, the quality of your work, for Lauderdale was this balance of ensuring that the results of scientific research should be made freely available. And it was very much driving that, but also it's got this huge exception in that, um, or I. Some may see it as a balance. I see it more as, more as an exception on that. What I think I'm going to try and do um, now, can I do this? I'll try my other computer. It might be helpful if I, if I can get that link posted. Let me just do that. No, that's not sure. So just while that's thinking about it, let me just see what else we have in the slider. Brilliant. So Richard Osler, hello Richard. Um, isn't it the license which determined if data can be considered open or not and under FAIR, the findable metadata must be open? Richard, absolutely. I think the most important thing is finding the license which is relevant to what you are doing and then seeing what it says. Now, most data will say if it is being open, but I think it's actually very important because if you haven't got the license in front of you and if someone has said to you, this data is open, um, I think some of the examples I've been including, that could mean so very many different things. And if the license said it must be fair and it's got to be open under a particular Creative Commons type of license, absolutely. And, I and, and it sounds like you're very much on top of this, but it's knowing that, I know, welcome people, other thoughts in the room, get the license, read it, know that people really, really mean it, and then work out how that can be more, more widely disseminated. Richard, does that does that does that help, or is that is that kind of the angle that you were you were looking at? I'm not sure if you're online or in the room. So, yeah, yeah, it does. I, I think it's the bit where the data hasn't got a license. My my understanding would be that any data is licensed, no matter what somebody says, that data cannot be considered open because we haven't got a license to describe how it can be used. Because that that license often is is the agreement between you as a user and the data. Data provider, so the data provider doesn't provide a license, but there is no grounds for them to say legally that that is an open data set. Yes, absolutely. I can't hear you particularly, I'm sorry, but yes, I, I, got, I got the gist of that. Absolutely. And I think if you so find, find the data, see what it says, and be aware of the limits which are on that, and be aware, I think, of the idea that just because we say it's open. The open is fair is great. Fair is a huge step forward over what it might have been in the past, but that doesn't mean it's free beer to do whatever you might want to do. You might want to do immediately. Matt, my computer is really, really misbehaving. But I will. Um, what I think I'll probably do afterwards anyway is, like I did last year, I will update the slides um, based on the point that we have we have been discussing so far and I'll put out some information of that Fort the Fort Lauderdale declaration in that. What I will say though um, is that it's it's not real. <laughs> That's a terrible thing for a lawyer to say. Um, it's not binding. It's it's um, it was a very valuable step forward because the community got together scientific community and said this is why we think good practice should be operating um, within our community. Um, but it's it's more of a, I suppose, a practice statement, perhaps, rather than being particularly binding in itself. 
so about but i'll share some more information about that so so thank, thank you matt for that okay shall we shall we uh, we also have a follow-up hmm. question Nami, on on slide wonderful thank you thank you Bushy. this is so above your day job <laughs> um uh, richard reeve hello richard um one person's metadata can be another person's data is it really reasonable to force it to be a, a particular creative, creative commons license in the case that Richard mentions here? Yeah, so that I think is a is a really, really important point. Um, and without getting too esoteric, can also think come into what we really are talking about, about metadata and data in relationship to particular data sets. Um, and it actually comes down to the question of control and the question of ownership. Um, does anyone have have any experiences on this that they would that they would they would like to share on this? R Richard, I know we, we 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 spoke we spoke before. Do you want to say anything about some of the experiences that you've had, or indeed type type more in type more in the slide <laughs> where you are? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, I can do. I mean, partly it's it's a recognition that uh, the when people are that often some of the metadata associated with our data can just be some uh, vocabulary or ontology that somebody's put enormous amounts of work into generating. And so saying that the metadata associated with that should just be CC0, they don't even get credit for it when you're using it, seems extraordinary. Um, uh, but, but it also, it gets worse than that. I mean, in that case, I think we, we certainly felt that it was completely reasonable to say that this metadata is, is CC BY or whatever, you know, it's just a different license and we don't care if somebody disagrees with that. Um, but 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 there's a worse case that we that we had dealing with the medics where they felt that some of the metadata was itself disclosing, um, um, and and um, and so and so they needed to keep the metadata inside their TREs, and we couldn't we we could only refer to that in the abstract. And basically at that point we just broke down and cried, and we didn't really have a solution to that. Um, uh, but um, yeah. Those, those are the two cases that I was thinking. Thank you. And that was, so it's that situation, what was driving the medics, for example, is that their funder requirements or their confidentiality? Or what, what you know, is it almost what they would like yeah, so that do, was, or, or is everyone free or people aren't free because they've, they've got their own rules hidden in their license conditions uh, or, or funder policies? Yeah, I mean, we couldn't quite get to the bottom of the detail, but I think the idea was fundamentally that some of the metadata would refer to specific conditions that were so rare that it was disclosive to even mention that the, that the conditions were in the data set, even though the, the information about them was, was, was kind of formally metadata. Um, and so, yeah, so yeah. They, they felt that under, the, under their regulations that they operate under some mystery, you know, patient confidentiality stuff, they couldn't release the mass data either. No, I, I, I understand. And that's and that actually brings home so 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 much of this that we're not, and I mean fortunately, because you've all got much more exciting things to do than negotiate individual licenses, but you are getting licenses which just exist and funder policies which just exist and are in some ways actually really limiting what you can do and you don't know the full the full story. And that comes to light as, as rich just said very forcefully um a long way down into your project so i mean in, a, in an ideal world it's um when you're starting out you know go to research managers go to funders really try and work out what what this is what this is going to happen try and preempt so perhaps you know, one of those clauses i've put in as well is you know is, is it metadata is it not what what might be the strictness other people would say if you're going to work with other people's data sets what what are their drivers but then who's got the time to, i mean there's a genuine question is that something that people have the time to do when you are planning your projects together or is it something which is almost arising accidentally because you weren't working together you can't can we could we plan our way out of this in the ideal world or is it not really something that, ha that happens like that any 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 thoughts on that because you know we could do our own declaration having said that they were they were just statements but they're valuable statements so this could be something we could work towards or is this a theory point or is this actually a real a real point of detail 
Any thoughts, Richard? Richard or other Richard or anyone else at all? Yeah, I mean, so our conclusion at the end of this somewhat agonizing process was that we basically had two classes of metadata, um, a kind of fundamental set of metadata that we couldn't imagine any circumstances under which this was disclosive or indeed data that was basically authors and associations and funders and this kind of much more generic metadata. Um, my mind has gone blank about the word for that kind of data. But anyway, you know, there was that kind of data and then all the other forms of metadata we treated just as data. It was data that was associated with other data in our data sets in a way that made it metadata but but it was actually just primary data in our data sets um and so uh and in our data analyses so that we could then apply our standard licensing rules to how that to how that data was being treated even though there was a sense in which we were kind of breaking fair principles about the mess data being cc0 or whatever um mm. You know, but but we felt that was the only way that we could really move forward was to was to essentially separate out these into two classes of methods. Interesting. Thank you. Look, what, what I'm going to suggest with you now is um, what I've tried to do, building on very much the helpful discussions, including I had with Richard, Richard um, a few weeks ago now. Um, I have tried to put together some starting checklists which have some sets of information and sets of training and things like that, which I think, my, I certainly find them very useful to me in trying to map the landscape in my head about the questions that people might want to ask themselves um, when they are starting and or working with information governance. I must give this massive health warning, and again, I'm probably quite relieved I'm not in the room. Um, you know, this, this, is, this might be, you may be way ahead of me, and you may think we know all this, Abby, don't be ridiculous, in which case, apologies. But um, if that is the case, I guess also useful for you to think about, um, is this the type of thing if someone was brand new to this space, just, just coming in, work, working with um, maybe a, a new grant holder or... Um, you maybe starting to work with it with a new company, something like that. Is this the type of thing that they might find helpful? Um, and it's at third level, so it might be helpful to you, it might be helpful to newcomers, it might be helpful um, to just contextualise where we seem to be right now, and then we are going to do a little bit of a, of a case study. So the first thing that I found, and um, it may be that some of you in the room were actually involved in creating this, but NERC have got a really good data tree training, online training, funded by NERC. It was launched in 2018. I have done some of it, not all of it, but I have done some of it. And I found the topics one, three and six were really, really good. So um, if anyone has done this or indeed wrote it, please do let me know. But I thought it was it was really quite good. So that is something that perhaps really might be useful if people are coming in. I find it helpful at the practical level, the difference between met metadata and data sets, um, the policy drivers engaging with industry, engaging with policymakers. Also, what I put up here, and again, I, I will, I will, I will work, work, work with, with with John and the team to get these these slides circulated around to everyone afterwards, updated with our discussion. Um, UKRI has a fantastic set of resources, um, including publishing your research funding, making your data open. What I did find particularly interesting, the lawyer in me, um, is that it doesn't refer to intellectual property rights. The previous version did refer to intellectual property rights. Um, in some ways I think this is really interesting because it shows that there's much more of a focus on making data open. Um, the other side of me kind of thinks, OK, so what are we going to do with the intellectual property rights then? Um, but it's saying you should record and make metadata available and discoverable to other researchers in a way that helps them understanding the research and reuse potential of the data. Published results should always include information about how to access supporting data to make sure you get the appropriate recognition. You may be entitled to a limited period of privilege use of the data you have collected and analysed to publish the results. The length of time depends on the research discipline and on the position of the research council. And that's actually very similar to what we see in, in the Fort Lauderdale Declaration, which I'll circulate in more detail. So that's that's good. It's very lawyerly again, and it's still it's, ju it's just that bit of a balance. So I don't know if you feel in, in your daily life if this is actually 
helpful or not, if you find it straightforward to find out what actually your relevant funder requirement is, for example. And if well, Richard's experience, we suggest it's really not always easy to have that distinction between metadata and data. Then we have UKRI policies and standards. Again, a lot of really good stuff there if you have the time to do it. And again, fully accept that, um, again, this might be something else we might want to work with, to perhaps suggest we might work with funders in the future, how this might be made a bit more user-friendly. Um, but there's a whole set of resources there on open research. Bridget, if we could click on, please. Um, we have the NARC data policy, which again, you may be intimately familiar with. I will confess having not been intimately familiar with it beforehand. Um, central to policy is that NERC funded scientists must make their data openly available within two years of collection. And perhaps within the situation you might have been in, Richard, I could see that could that could be really quite, quite a, a, a challenging, challenging situation. You must deposit it in a NERC data center for long term preservation. And the aim, the aim is that all NERC funded data are managed and made available for everyone to use without any restriction. And I think that's the type of statement that, you know, it, it, that can be taken out of context and that people could read that and suggest I can use anyone's data immediately for any purpose I like. Um, and given the careful balances that we've been seeing, I don't think that really is what's, what is being, being meant or it's certainly within the caveats that we saw. UKRI site also has policing, licensing and charging information, um, which I rather enjoyed because that's the kind of thing I like, but really good set of resources. We also have the UK government licensing framework, um, and that's a much wider framework. National Archives, for example, um, open government license can be, can be found there. Um, again, really welcome thoughts on whether this is something that you are engaging with with a lot or whether you're working more only with, say, the, 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 the NERC guidance and, and policy approaches. We are seeing a real drive um, by, for example, the Geospatial Commission to making geospatial data more accessible, but it's very much, very much a more. It's not fully. It's only applying to, 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 to the geo six. And we do have the data exploration license. And that is a situation upon you which you can freely access data for the purposes of ex exploration, very much pre-commercialization. Um, but that is very much seen as a step by the Geospatial Commission to try to deliver some of the geospatial strategy which we find. And again, really welcome thoughts on whether this is something which people are, are finding helpful on the ground, or indeed you may have been involved in drafting it, or whether this is seen as something that's frankly just a bit too complicated and it's hidden away no way in websites. We have the open government license reusing public sector information as well um, as we mentioned and that can that can obviously be extremely important. That as I spent a lot of time analyzing this and that is not there's a lot of caveats in there as well. So simply because you're getting that information don't blithely assume that everything that you are getting under that can be used on a Creative Commons basis. There, there's, there's a lot of caveats, particularly if information is being obtained, which is actually the subject of someone else's intellectual property rights. Bruce, if we could move on. Thank you. Um, so now we started to dig in some of the, the, the NERC's funded um, bodies for, 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 for whatever is the appropriate term. Um, fantastic set of resources, British Geological Survey, um, the National Geoscience Data Centre with the Open Geoscience set of pages. We have a big licensing page with page on intellectual property rights. Um, again, love to know if these are things that you are all intimately familiar with or if it's something that is just noise, which you, you don't have time to do and, and how might we, we be able to, to move forward in this space if so. We have the British Oneographic Data Centre webpage. It's got um, guidelines on how you might submit data and it's got information in relation to copyright. Bridget, if we could click on again. Oh, sorry, took the wrong way on my screen. Then we have the Centre for, for Environmental Data Analysis. I know that last time we spent a lot of time talking about Jasmine, the terms and conditions of use of, of the Jasmine resource. We've got the deposit and the, the acquisition policies which apply. And then very close to home, obviously, now um, I forgot to give my love to Cambridge. I was at Newhall, as I still call it, Murray Edwards, around the corner from Churchill. So 
not very far, so lots of happy memories of Cambridge. British Atlantic Survey UK Polar Centre data, um, metadata guidance from them, data citation and publishing, and also the public sector geospatial agreement, which um, can be a very important part, depending on what you're doing, of working with the ordnance survey work. And on to our last checklist version. Um, I quite like this, this, this top resource. So this is the Open Knowledge Foundation talking about what do we mean by open? Now, this doesn't have one answer and the Open Knowledge Foundation are, are particularly keen on information being really freely, widely available to everyone for all, all purposes. But I think it's an important reminder that whether that's working with, with a partner, whether that's working with, with a new funder, um, perhaps if you're, if you're working with some activist groups, they may have a particular view and they might think that fair is not is not enough and, and how does that tie in with what with what you are trying to do then we've got the public sector scotland's end user license the the jncc has a set of resources the creative commons license we spent a lot of time talking about a couple of creative commons licenses there are many, many available. Again, it sounds like at least some people in the room are very familiar with some of them. So, but do be careful. It doesn't mean free to everyone for, for any purposes. And also just that final resource from the World Meteorological Organization. They've been doing a lot of work in relation to open standards. And again, it's not, it's not totally open. There are some different restrictions which are put in place depending on the type, is it core information, for example, or is it not? But really interesting to see um, some, some new policies which have been developed after a lot of international negotiation in relation to that. So those are things that I was wondering if they were of any interest to you or what else might be of any interest to you or in thinking about, I'm going to work in the information and governance space and I simply don't know where to start. I also accept that these things are structured might not be particularly helpful either, but is there something else that anyone is using that they find particularly helpful? Do, do any universities or any funders, have, other funders have particularly great training that people go on? Any any thoughts that anyone would like to share in relation to any of that? No. Um, so what we might do, oh, sorry. Oops, coming. Um, Somebody's got a question. Please. I'm going to start the question into the, into the camera. Give Matt Fry. Hello. Hello. Yeah, we, That's my camera there. The camera, you get the other side. That's it. Mr. Moore, where did you need to go? I've got to try and remember what it was now. Um, I think the point about ownership is quite interesting. And I was wondering if there's a way to help people almost sort of replace that feeling of ownership with the feeling of um, ownership of, or the ownership or the kind of recognition of the DOI. Is that, is, that, is that how we can make that move from people feeling like that's, that's their data set to they, that they own the data to the fact that they, they own or they're kind of, they own the responsibility for that, the, the publication of the data set. Yes, I think that's a really nice idea because there are, and I mean, I have, I've never minted a DOI. I'm, I'm sure, sure some of you in the room have, but to, to go through that, there's a real process of, you know, reviewing integrity, the process which, which you have gone through um, and to have been awarded a DOI, particularly for a data set, is a, is a big thing. And that, and, the, and that brings with that, not, not that it's something that can be, I mean, ownership, can have real connotations of power or control and exclusivity and you can't let anyone else use it which is really not where where we are looking at going but it's the fact that it's some form of, of of recognition that you have that people will know it's i guess well quite quite question back to you i suppose but it seems that that really could be a way of the fact that you have a doi in, in relation to that and that's a really big deal and that may be just as important or as getting a grant or, or get, getting a publication. And I think that does seem to tie into the general movement of, of an open approach, a stewarding approach 
um, and un uh, even an unlocking the value, which, which again we, we noted, which could be seen as having a more commercial connotation, but it's 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 respecting but it's finding a different way of creating that that link so yeah I, I i think that could could really work and is that something matt and others that that you're seeing just now that's or is it just seen as a, a more perhaps administrative side of things yeah i think so kind of in terms of talking people around to the idea well People who are already obliged to, to publish their text and talking them around to the idea of doing it, kind of, you know, the carrot is, is, the, is the DOI and the kind of uh, recognition. Mm -hmm. And getting a DOI again, so you know, I've read all these policies, I'm sure you're all very familiar with them as well. But is do people get DOIs as a matter of course? Is that where we are, or is there more of a why do I have to do this? I've got a million and one other things to do type of thing. You get the DOI for publishing it into the NERC data centers. So they get they get that as a matter of course, but then you get the argument of, well, I have to do all this work to, to get it to be yeah. But that isn't that's already stated in the policy that they have to do that. It's more yeah, I, 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 absolutely. So I mean it seems very clear what is to be done, but um this that so it 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 sounds that it's, it's embedded up to that point, but perhaps beyond that there's a bit less a bit more fluid. Uh, okay, so where is you? If uh, you can... I mean, oh, sorry, sorry. I think a couple of questions or Please. comments from the room. Please, uh, yeah. I think. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I just, I mean, the DOI thing is great, um, but I'm just a bit concerned that the policies that enforce um, freedom to use data in short periods of time are massively, massively discriminatory. And, and uh, because because what happens is that there are some very, very big groups out there in everybody's field. There are some very, very big groups out there with lots of resources to do analyses, but they may not have access to specific sites and specific areas where smaller groups with very little resources spend decades collecting data sets and then are forced to release them. And then somebody else just hoovers it up and publishes it and acknowledges the DOI. And it's like, yeah, OK, fine. You acknowledge my idea why, but you also stole my next three research papers. Um, uh, and 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 that's not a fair balance. No. I think it's really problematic. And, you know, whilst, you know, a lot of what I do is about making, trying to improve the understanding of the importance of the data sets and the people who generate the data sets in this process, we can't dismiss the fact that the, the, the primary publications being nicked by big groups from small groups is exactly the opposite of what we want to achieve here, even if it means that research happens a year or two quicker um, and progress gets made a year, you know, a year or two faster. If what we're doing is undermining those small groups and making it possible for them to become, you know, big groups themselves, then that's not a win. No, thanks. And and is this is this a debate which has taken place with with funders? Um, I know as an analogy, um, in the UK and right now in Australia, where, where I've just been, there, there's been debates about how quickly you have to release your, your data about where the oil is under the sea and what is a fair period of time for someone to have a period of exclusivity and then when should it be shared. And in Australia, they're looking at shortening it. Um, is Was there ever that sort of debate with any of the funders? You know, we've seen reference to two years. Yeah, I mean, I'm new into where, this. Where did that come from? I mean, I'm certain that debate's been had many times and, and you know, but it, but the pressure all, is always to bring that number of years down to allow mm -hmm. people to have more access quicker. And I totally understand the motivation behind it, so long as it's accompanied by really fair credit for the data generation itself. But actually, this you can go too far, I think. You can just go too far because, you know, I mean, maybe you have to have a special clause for small groups saying they don't have to release yeah, their data yeah. as quickly. But, yeah. but, but, but. But you see this all the time in, in some domains, not in all domains, but in some domains of large groups, heavily computational large groups hoovering up data and publishing more sophisticated analyses than the generators of the data were able to in such a short time. And it's, and it's really problematic for the ability of those small groups to develop and to get credit for their work, no matter how much we value the data. 
yeah no that that's really interesting and again that almost some of that maybe takes us back to whether we're calling ownership whatever we're talking you know, talking about what are we rewarding and what are we needing to reward um and if we are still in a place and again maybe even with the new ref we're still if publication is still what everyone is really really after and it's the most the, and it's most substantive and maybe the second and third publication that are all are equally important as that first one then this system actually which is trying to achieve great things but is actually very unfair as, as you have set out because someone so, so, someone does the work it's been seen as a public asset but is it really a public asset and and on are the balances which, which are being struck in in the most sensible of places no that's really really interesting and very interesting time with what matt was saying because but so you could get more credit for getting that DOI, you could have proper acknowledgement, but if the real benefit is actually still in that second publication that you'd really like to do, then we can see that that very deep unfairness, which might be coming out, coming out in there. Interesting. Uh, we okay. have two more, two more comments. Would you like to go this one a bit? Or... Uh, you can move a bit nearer, but it's on a wire, so it won't go very far. <laughs> so we are normalizing the use of DOIs for publishing data uh, within our research institute and one of the, the reasons we're doing that is to give the recognition re and reward so it's part of that that door that open fuller research assessment um, yep. of raising data set the profile of data sets as a research output and often that is a greater benefit to people who traditionally aren't on the publications um, so yep. the technicians and so on so they're you know yep. they're they are getting real recognition from using things like DOIs. I think that the, yeah, the, the poaching aspect can be problematic. I think it's very overstated. Now, if you've been working on data for on, on something for, for 10, 20 years and you've still not published, are you ever going to publish? Mm -hmm. So what I think the, the, the context to frame it in is more around collaboration. And again, it's making that data a valid research output that you get credit for as the producer. So mm -hmm. whether that is through the, the, the correct citation of DOI, not as an acknowledgement, which you can't really get the metrics from, but mm -hmm. a correct citation of that DOI, um, or being a collaborator, you know, a co-author on the papers that are produced. Uh, if the data is really that impactful, I don't think it's right, especially if it's publicly funded, to be sitting on that data because you may publish from it in the future. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's not what I'm saying at all, just to be clear. The, the data sets I'm talking about are generated in the field by people doing sampling work year in, year out to create longitudinal data sets that take long periods of time to collect in order to, to, to produce significant results. And then they get one paper out of it and it's gone and other people are publishing on it. And it's fine to say, well, you should have published the paper after five years, but if, they would never have funded a 10-year longitudinal study if they thought five years was going to be enough. Um, uh, so they might have got a half hour paper after five years and then another half hour paper after 10 years. And they, you know, and that's, that's fundamentally the problem. It's not about people sitting on data. Um, it's about once the stuff is actually in a state where you can then publish it, you publish it, and then the next paper is gone uh, because somebody's hooted it up. It's really, you know, I mean, I, and I say this as somebody who's, I'm, I'm a data consumer. I, I, you know, my background's AI, machine learning, computing. I'm a data analyst. I don't generate data. But I'm horrified by the exploitation of people who generate data. Um, uh, you know, in my community, it's absolutely mortifying seeing what people are doing to these people slaving in the fields, um, uh, collecting the data. And, and it's just wrong. And they know it's wrong, but they see they get an extra paper out of it. And it's like, well, that was more important. So I've got to turn back on this. So, so I work a lot on tech research, and, and we have several. And we go to national bioscience research infrastructures that are equivalent to, to the national capabilities. Um, we have a remit to publish data from these sites in the things we get along to the not very long work data sets. Um, and for us, it's, it, it's pushing the data out there. It's ultimately just patient for continuing to fund these infrastructures. Uh, and we have to demonstrate that the data is being used um, by the whole possibly number of people because that's that's how we get funded, obviously. Yeah, so it's going to vary depending on what your background is, you know, but, but these mm -hmm. researchers in the field who are academics in university departments who are getting research grants to do specific projects, it's not, 
So it sounds almost as if there's that, you know, we spoke about possible carve out for, for, for smaller teams, but maybe it's even about just a bit of a maybe more granular approach to what is the type of the data with a longitudinal study, you might be looking at something different, or is it about different forms of, rec of, of recognition? If someone is focusing more on more on data generation, can can there be a different form of rec of recognizing that? Um, or should we all are are we stick you know heretical statements? Are 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 we stuck with the fact that the publication is the most important thing? And then if so, should there be a way of of, of trying to find different times we can do that? You know, I've written down the mortifying exploitation. Um, and that sort of really resonated with me. So yeah, I think um you know much more than I do, which was definitely the aim of the game. So I'm le I'm learning a lot from that. But yeah, maybe maybe that's something when we come right back down to what we want, we might want to do. Is that something to feed back in to feed back into funders? Not challenging open, not challenging fair, but just this isn't working in in, in some particular situation, and it seems very counterproductive from what is being done. Um, can I? I think we have one final question for now, and then we Chris, could move on to a case study, or did we pick that up? Yeah. Just so, I will, so I want to respond to this because uh, I'm asking yeah. the, the this issue of um, uh, data being put away and then worked on later. It's I think it's an unknown problem and it's used as an it, uh, where I've seen it used. It's been used as an excuse. If you get money from a research council grant in the UK, it has been the the data policy for many years. The, the, the NERC data policy applies if you're collecting on environmental data, no matter which research council you is actually paying your grant. The NERC data policy is the policy that applies. And that states and has said for at least the last decade that you will deposit your data within two years. And if you don't want that money, don't take that. If you don't want that condition on you, don't take that money. That's the answer. Uh, I've just, I, I'm a grant holder in the UK UH program and have just had my red notice to say I hadn't done it, which kicked me up the backside get on and do it because it said very clearly that under the terms of that policy that we've all signed if we've taken money out of NERC um, that we are liable to cessation of grant funding and, and a, a blacklisting for future grant funding. Those are the rules of the system and that is the rule we are working. Anybody who behaves badly deserves to be pilloried by their community and I will be the first person to uh, to support any action if somebody's day, uh, been stealing data but I haven't seen it in my own area. I just want to make a specific problem. One issue we do need to get a handle is data quality. As British Geological Survey, we hold a lot of legacy data. We just uh, just had some data um, published by a researcher. We'd supplied some data with, to him saying, this is all we've got on this. We know it's rubbish, but this is what we have. And he then published it without our permission and has now rescinded it because we pointed this out to him. But we do. there does have to be a point to say, we're very happy to give you data, but don't publish it on if we know that they're off methodological flaws in the way it was discovered and this is particularly a problem with legacy data so there are grounds to say we really advise you not to but we but you have uh, uh, yeah, the data has to be open if the public are paid for it because they expect that of us fantastic thank you uh, any anyone want to come back on any of that or or is any other points Sorry, I'm just going to have one more go get my point across. I'm absolutely in favour of open data. This is what I work on. But half of my job is working on open and fair data. I'm not opposed to open data. I'm just opposed to not getting the correct credit for your work. And the and, and I'm not opposed to the data policy. I'm just opposed to to to. I'm just concerned that as we that the more the more we push earlier and earlier publication of data, the more there's the risk that I dive out. And I certainly know many people who've experienced this. I've worked with MRC, WHO collaborating centres who are screaming about this, that their data is being stolen off them um, day by day by day and being published by groups that don't understand the data they're working with, but it's getting published in nature anyway, even though they're the principal world experts on this subject, but, they're, but it's taking them time to do the analysis because they're busy trying to choose the next flu vaccine for the seasonal flu jab and and this this stuff is going on as i speak and i you know i'm not i'm not making it up because i benefit from this process i benefit from being able to take these data off these off these of these resources i'm just saying that, that it's a it's a real concern and i'll 
point to one thing that demonstrates what the problem is here. So talking to all the people that I work with who do field work, and I really don't doubt that it's the same with the, in the Newark area, but this is BBSLC and MRC I'm talking about. The, the, um, they say it's now impossible to get funding for surveillance because surveillance just generates data and you don't guarantee you're going to get any, any results out of it. And so you may have to do this for quite a long time before you get anything interesting out. In, in the meantime, all that data has been hoovered up by other people. You've had to release it and they've, they've done like minor analyses on it. And you were looking for some outbreak that might happen a couple of years in the future. But they, you know, the, 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 the data is hugely valuable, but because you can't hold on to it and you can't gain credit for it, they go, well, look, there was no, there were no research outputs from this, uh, from, from the surveillance study you did. It's like, well, there, there was a risk. There'd be literally nothing because it's surveillance. We don't know what's going to happen, but also, these other people published based on our data because we released it because of an earlier draft that we had to put out of the data. And these kinds of things, I mean, I'm not, you know, it's, it's a real problem. And the, and the fact that surveillance is so hard to fund now, it's, it's, I think all comes back to, to, how, to how quickly the people doing that drudgery are, are, are having to release their data and not getting credit for it. And so it looks like the grass is being on Thank, thank you. Yes, yeah, so, so that sounds maybe in that in that particular space, there's the there's the the need to share. There's then the fact that others are are benefiting on that data. The the, the grant holder isn't able to show the outputs which came from that, and so the next so they're being less successful getting the next type of grant. If, if I'm understanding right, and it, and maybe that's an, an an example of the particular differences that we are seeing. Um, that might not be the case in in, in other experiences that our, our other our other speaker, I'm sorry, can't pick up on the names, um, was talking about, but we're definitely seeing that in the BBSRC and MRC space. But Bef before we move on, um, there was a talk about, yeah, you know, people should be, if, if this practice is going on, and clearly it is for some, but not for others, um, that they should be reviled by their peers. They weren't your words, but that's how I understood it. I mean, does that happen? Yeah. You know, I, I spoke before about sort of instinctive and, and emerging and, and very clear scientific norms. I mean, if people do, I, I, I know there's you know, new practices which are emerging in terms of retraction and, and, and things like that. Um, if people are using other people's data, how, how, how does the sector respond? I mean, one example, uh, as an analogy, a serious analogy, but I know that um, comedians don't believe in copyright law. But if someone steals anyone else's jokes, no one is allowed in the club and that's a real reality and it's a real 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 threat and it's much more effective than anything the courts might be able to do i mean what, what how does it work in the scientific world if someone did encounter some of the things that, that richard's been been experiencing so i can tell you what happens in practice in the in the in the mrc bbsc groups that i've been involved in so fao uh, who ref labs that i know that i know the, the people who run the labs personally they say they will never work with any of these groups again, and they'll name the groups of people who they think just steal their data willy-nilly and publish nature paper after nature paper without ever collaborating with them, just citing the data that they, that they, that they put in their open literature. And they say the, the papers are wrong because they don't understand the data, yeah. and, and, and they're getting no credit for it, and it drives them absolutely insane. So yeah. they be refuse to do it, but these are senior professors. They can choose not to ever work with these people. You know, a lot of our, a lot of the junior researchers yeah. don't have that luxury, um, and so and so you know, so that that's that's that that's the end result of the process that I'm okay. a little bit angry about. <laughs> no, no, I, 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 I get, I get that. I, and what about anyone else? I mean, any other things that people have have seen? Any experiences, direct or indirect, of this has been happening, and, and the community is is responding or that feels a bit like Richard Sherwood back. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think there's a there's a big gap between theory and practice when it comes to reuse of data. So I mean, we we make lots of data freely available. Um it's all under well yeah the vast majority of it is under Creative Commons attribution license. Mm -hmm. But the problem we see is that is at the journal side and the editorial side is that they 
the journals aren't enforcing the practice that they're meant to be enforcing in their journal data policies around data citation. And if you don't have that data, that correct data citation, you can't get the metrics on yep. how your data is being used. And that's that's what we need to report back to our, our funders to show that impact. So yeah, that's, that's really, that's really interesting. Problem. That's that's fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. Sorry, one, one more thing about the end results of this process. Um, so so for the, there are five global seasonal flu rat labs. They all used to release their data. Only one does now, it's the UK. Everybody else has stopped. It's all private because they're fed up with having their data stolen. Um. Interesting. Okay. Wow. 50 minutes to go. So we're going to tiny bit for you if you go on the next slide. So this slide has now been massively overtaken, but humor me. Um, we are going to talk about an example. A researcher wishes to explore experiences of flooding on the CAM for old time's sake. Um, the researcher is thinking of using four databases. One, which is the Research Council resource. Perhaps NERC data policy may be, may be irrelevant in other NERC approaches. One which has been developed by, by a public body. This is sort of deliberately neutrally, neutrally termed. One was developed by a large multinational corporation. One, one database was organically developed, developed by, by someone and has now been bought by a large multinational corporation. Um, the resource is not involving any personal information. The researcher wants to share the data to support their, their publication and indeed depending on the funder which is coming around they may of course be absolutely obliged to do it but they're wanting to share the data. They're also wanting to combine data coming from the four data sets and they're wanting to add data for a next generation approach and they're very much having in their mind how they can look more widely in their own project in everything that they are doing. This reflects you know, one, one, one of the bits of feedback I got from, got from someone, how, how is there a space for people to look more widely in their own project and the data that they are generating. They want to make a publication immediately open access. They would like to pass the, the new data set on to partners, to some for money and some for not. They want to enable a new spin out company and they would also like to address an imminent climate related emergency. And yes, this is exactly how I write exam questions for my students. Um, so I thought this might be we'll probably overtaking some of this in our discussion, but I thought this might be quite interesting to see. Bruce, if you could just flick on to the next slide just momentarily. I'm wondering what you would do if you were placed with something like this. You may indeed have experienced this or, or, or something similar. Um, and what do you think you would need to think about something solving this type of problem? Um, and is it there? Are we talking about, about new types of policies that have deliberately been trying to move into that more pr private, private sector type of approach? What might we want to do? So I'm going to give us... Um, just just a few minutes um, to, to, to reflect individually. Um, Bruce, if you could flick flick back. Um, oh, that's thank you. Um, just what 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 th this type of fact pattern, um, which um, may may not be time your experience may or may not be realistic, but I think it draws together quite a few things that I've been coming about and some of the, the people I, I've been consulting with as well. Um, what 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 would happen what could it work where might where might you loop so a couple of minutes just to to reflect on that and then we'll we'll chat it through oh and richard thank you for your slido post on the elixir rdm resources i will add them Sorry, Abby, what's the second yeah. database? We can't see it because your your head is in front of the thing. Oh, 
so, sorry, the second database is developed by developed by a public body? Yeah, yeah. I was going to say that. Yeah. On that basis, I think you might as well forget it. <laughs> <Those are trying laughs> to forget. If the license doesn't exist already, the chances of getting a license and time scaling projects are practically you know, <laughs> We've been talking to five years trying to get access to the data. I mean, we might have to move things on a bit more rapidly because I think people who've been sweating in the other two rooms are quite keen to stretch okay. the legs I'm in total. That's so fine. we okay. may need to wrap up in about five or so minutes. That's fine. We can absolutely wrap up in five. Okay, seeing the discussion has started. So what what do we think? Research times four databases, research kinds of resource, we we've we've chatted through and we've noted the challenges within that. Um someone shared an experience of a public body um and you've been trying to negotiate for five years. I mean, generally, generally, they're very environmentalists. The, the they're very good at having open data sets, but if it's not already in their pipeline to make it open, then the chances of them, you know, bringing in through that pipeline in a reasonable time are practically zero. So they've got good, they've got good existing open resources, but ones that aren't open, um, they as well yeah. locked up from the bottom seat. Yeah, I think I think that 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 certainly ties in with a lot of things I've been doing. Um, Owen Bazwari is one person I'm sure you know has been in a lot of work. Um, you know, tracking when people say open access, what they're really meaning, and yeah, things are locked. They're either shared or they're not shared. And unpicking that, I think, is is like to be to, to be really difficult. Any anyone any experience of working with with, with, with the private sector? No, okay, so maybe that, that's not, and, and, sorry, please. I was going to say sometimes, and, and I guess it depends on their interest in the project. Yeah. That idea of the last point where you're actually trying to do, do something for money, they probably want to know all the details about and how much it was going to bring in and how much you might be able to pass into them. <laughs> so again, it all slows it, slows it down in experience. I, th I think that's right. And I think then we're looking at the difference between this is a business and we're all going to we're all going to make money or we're wanting to use data because we're wanting to address a, a climate emergency. And there's probably not really much money flying around about that. And obviously that has a lot of echoes of what's happened with, with COVID and certainly what's been seen um, from the IP side, certainly in relation to, to health uh, and vaccines and data was that basically there, the public spiritedness seemed to disappear pretty quickly, which is not to criticise, people have to make money, they, they have their metrics, their KPIs, how the business models are run, but they went very quickly back into a traditional private sector reward model. So perhaps this isn't going to, isn't consistent with that fair and open type of approach. Um, what worries me, I will confess as some of you know, then is that we also have the, the this data which was developed on an open basis and suddenly that ends up being bought by the private sector. So it started off being open and then it's shut down again. And that's something that really worries me. I'm not aware of so much of that, something which has happened yet, but I think that's probably something to kind of to kind of look out for. So when it happens, you can remember that I said I said that first. OK, Bridget, can we click on just thank you to, jo to John's warning. If you click on to the next one as well. Um, so really quickly going to run through this, um, some of the points uh, and then the slide will come around after. There's lots of discussion going on in other spaces, digital twins, credo, some of you are way ahead of me in relation to the NERC possibility of the digital management framework. I've spoken about discussions in oil and gas in the UK about sharing information quickly and how we balance those same interests. AI, I'm at conference in, in, in Japan, we're doing a lot of talk about AI. Who owns that? Liability, reward, regulation, totally unclear everywhere in the world and it's changing. It's highly relevant to, to what we're doing in this space, but that will continue to change. And I think also relevant is the EU data strategy, which also is very keen on public use of, of private use of public data and vice versa, and is trying to develop some regimes to make that happen. Talks a nice game on standards and interoperability and funding, keeps carving out IP and trade secrets and the and respect for private power and there's no data access right. So I think that the, this whole balance about public private reward time is going to continue there. Bruju, if we could click on again. Great. 
term of the moment I noticed before is unlocking value. Everyone is very keen on unlocking value. Um, this idea that there's, there's this mountain of cash just hidden under the data. Now you're much, 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 much closer to, to, to that than I am, whether that's really likely to be true. In relation to Scotland and health, there's talk of moving away from a culture of caution, that people have been too scared to share information because you think that we, they think it belongs to someone. We're almost, I think, in working in that different space. A lot of this, not necessarily always, as we saw with the private sector examples, but if something is publicly funded, and that perhaps that is something which should be freely available. But how do we fairly unlock that value? And you know, we've also had some experiences that people feel things are being done very unfairly. NERC's doing a lot of work on this, you know, through the Digital Solutions Programme. I know some of our community have been involved in this. The delivery plan going forward, improving connectivity is one of its focus, the digital strategy, making the best use of digital assets, maximizing value again, making it accessible, making it interoperable. Yep. The issues are there, they are being recognized, but it doesn't yet sound, I would say, from our discussion today, that the real practicality of how we're really making that work completely. I'm really interested in the point the points of funders uh, or publishers and, and the respect for individual situations perhaps aren't there. If you can go on to the next one, now don't worry, we don't have to read it all, but th this, this is the results of the very recent Geospatial Commission call for evidence about opportunities across the economy. And I find this really interesting. Um, it's basically saying Ordnance Survey, as an example, might be hindering innovative applications because of the need to demonstrate commercial returns. The Netherlands are making more information much more freely available and we should do this here. So that's one, one, one type of angle. People saying access to geospatial data is one of the key driver of change. We need to integrate more data sets, but people are lacking resources and lack of incentives to share data, high costs associated with implementing data sharing, but also more geospatial data is being increasingly collected by multiple private sector actors rather than a single uh, public authority, even though notice that they often won't give us the data either. And if you could click on again, um, value chain doesn't differentiate between public and private sector value chains. Now, again, you may know this because this is what's coming from the marketplace anyway, but I think it's a very interesting angle um, that NERC and other funders, they have that particular angle, which is so important, but also existing uh, alongside that private, private sector space. Um, and there's a bit more there. I think we'd leave it at that. If we go on to the last one, so thank you. We are we are done. I hope, I hope that's, that's all right, John. Thank you. Fa fantastic discussion. I've learned so much from that. I will I will work up the slides and pick up some 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 of the points that have been made. Um, question, which we can definitely keep going afterwards and in the bar. I won't be at dinner. Um, and and do get in touch with me afterwards. You, know, what what might we be able to do? As a as a community, is is there anything that we think we might be able to? Is that pressure on on journals, for for example? Um, is it some sort of new, new new declaration? What might help at a practical level to ensure that the present system works as fairly as it can? But perhaps also maybe as we're moving to that bit more of that public private intersection, which does seem to be certainly part of of the landscape. Um, and I that that's all I wanted to say. Any final points anyone would would like? Very very make? quickly. <laughs> very very quickly. Thank you, Joe. No. Okay. Well, thank you I very could... much, Abby. Thank you, Bert. Thank Bert, you so Bert. much. Apologies, I couldn't be there. Really well discussion. Uh, and Bert, Bert, you and John, thank you so very 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 much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank well, you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.